Welcome everybody to Let's Talk Computer Science, a podcast dedicated to talking about the past, present, and future of computer science. This podcast is made possible by our friends at Rex Academy. Be sure to check out their amazing CS platform, including courses on cybersecurity, app development, and AI. Yes, I know everyone's buzzword, AI. Don't have a CS teacher? That's not a problem. Rex is now providing instructors remotely as part of their platform. Be sure to check them out at rex.academy. And today on the show, I'm excited to have one of the OG, one of the member, one of the people that I flock to go see whenever I get a chance to see him speak. This is Gary Steger. He's the founder and CEO of Constructing Modern Knowledge. Gary, welcome to the podcast. Thanks. Great to be here, Carl. So give me a little bit of your origin story. Before we get into computer science, I want to hear about you. Like, how, What got you started on this path? What, what made you excited about tech, ed tech, and all of this? Uh, I, I imagine it's probably an interesting tale there. Around 1975, I was a middle school student at Skyro Koufax Junior High School in Wayne, New Jersey. And in seventh grade, every seventh grader at the time was required to take a nine-week computer programming class with Mr. Jones. We had one or two teletypes connected to a timeshare mainframe system somewhere. And for the first time in my life, I felt smart. I felt intellectually powerful. I felt creatively expressive. Because we didn't know it was impossible, we thought everything was possible. And and that began about six years of um, programming computers and falling in love with com- programming computers and challenging my friends and peers and pulling each other up by our bootstraps. There was a several year period during which we had, hadn't seen a piece of software that wasn't written by someone we knew. Um, wow. I remember when I remember when we saw the first piece of software written by someone else. It was it was kind of like a gods must be crazy moment. <laughs> where what is this thing and what is this manual? Um, and and I should say that this wasn't gifted and talented or special ed or vocational training. This was in the the cycle between baking a souffle and making a tie rack. <laughs> um, it, I was fortunate enough to, to grow up in a um, suburban school district 20 miles west of New York City that got a computer in 1962, I think. Um, and by, by 74, when I was I had seen I had seen the teletypes when I was in the third grade. Um, but by the time I got to seventh grade, it was a requirement for every kid to have the, that, that programming class. And it, it'd be worth returning to that, that idea a little later. But um, and then I spent the rest of junior high and high school spending like every free moment programming and eventually, you know, was was running the mainframe, had a key to the office that the mainframe was in and the the notebook with the passwords written in it. And um, I still don't understand. <laughs> Cyber I, still don't under- I still don't understand Octal. To this day, um, well, I'll, I'll tell you a story. In ninth grade, I wrote a computer program that when you logged into the timeshare system, it you logged in, but then it generated an error message, which I decided that should be one of the error messages should be randomly generated. So it generated a random error message that was plausible that asked you to log to type your password again, and then when oh. you t- and then when you typed your password, it captured it was captured in a file which I couldn't actually read. I had to print on paper tape and then I had to figure out a way to read paper tape. Um, and then I could, you know, steal passwords. But as I mentioned a moment ago, I had a key to the room and the notebook with the passwords written in it anyway. So this was just kind of a hacking adventure. Um, and I was proud of myself when I had read in Cliff Stoll's book, The Cuckoo's Egg, years later, that there were Soviet spies who had done the exact same thing. Wow. Um, and I got busted for it. And... It, and since you mentioned cybersecurity, it's worth telling this story. I, I got busted for it by a 12th grader in the school who dragged me, you know, kind of by the ear to, <laughs> uh, to Dr. Henry Peterson, who was in charge of math and computing in the school district. And um, Henry Peterson um, looked at the kid who was ratting me out and, and said, at least he's thinking and pointed at me. Ooh, um, that's good. There and we that, go. And that was kind of the end of it. And you know, a year out of high school, I started working with with Dr. Peterson and um, formed the New Jersey Educational Computing Conference. And, you know, my career as a teacher educator began long before I had a bachelor's degree. Um, So I, I, the other part of that story is I I spent, you know, every waking moment programming computers through high school, and then graduated in 1981 thinking, well, that was kind of fun, but no one will ever have a computer that, and I was told I couldn't, I was told I couldn't study computer science because I wasn't good at math. And my interests were in becoming a jazz musician, which I pursued until my conspicuous lack of talent caught up with me. Um, <laughs> and, and and so I, I graduated in 81 and in 1982 began began one of the first computer programming camps for kids anywhere. And um, 
soon after that began teaching teachers. So I've been at this for 41 years professionally. Add another half dozen years if you consider teaching peers how to program. So what mentors along the way? I mean, it sounded like you had a mentor there that kind of, you know, a principal there that called you out, but in a positive light. Who, who have you had, like, if you looked up to over the years and like, kind of as you've grown through this CS adventure? Well, so, so, you know, I wish Mr. Jones was still alive because I would love to talk to him about his his origin story because in 1975, there was no county office. There was no ISTE conference for him to go to. There were, you know, no webinars for him to watch. And, and he had to have been a great teacher because he figured out a way to keep 25 seventh graders engaged with one or two terminals in the room. <clears throat> and I'd love to have a, a, a more thorough discussion with him. And then there was this, like I said, this Henry Peterson was the director of, of math and computing in my home school district, who I then worked with as a professional for about a dozen years after that. Um, and, and then in the early 80s, when I started going to conferences, I met people like Dan Watt, who wrote a book called Learning with Logo that, that sold 100,000 copies in the early 80s. Um, I met David All, who wrote the first computer book that sold a million copies called um, uh, Basic Computer Games. He was the publisher and editor of Creative Computing Magazine. And here's an interesting statistic for you. In 1984, Creative Computing had 400,000 subscribers. Okay. Pa- paid monthly subscribers for a computer in programming 84? magazine in 1984. Wow. Um, and, then, and then in 1985... I met people like Cynthia Solomon, the mother of educational computing, and Seymour Papert, the father of educational computing, and then started a relationship with them that that continued until Seymour's passing in um, 2016, I believe. And Cynthia is part of my Constructing Modern Knowledge faculty next week. So we've had a long relationship. And they began advocating for every kid to have a computer and for every kid to be programming um, when they created the logo programming language in 1967. So I stand on the shoulders of on, on on those giant shoulders in the work that I do, and and when I started going to conferences, I met people like David Thornburg, and, and you know one yeah. of the, the one of the seminal moments of my life was being at a, a logo conference in Los Angeles. I think in the fall of 1985, this is the furthest I had ever traveled. I was still you know I was 22 years old at the time. Um, and it was kid, a cocktail. Yeah. Po- yeah, it was. And it was. Yeah, it was Jersey kid. And I probably brought a computer with me, like a two GS in a bag or something. I know later in the <laughs> later on, I actually carried a two GS with a monitor across country a few times. Um, but I, there was a cocktail party, a re- welcome reception at at this conference, and I remember vividly David Thornburg and Brian Silverman, who is another mentor and friend who was responsible for basically creating any of the software, particularly in the logo family, whether it was any of the versions of logo or scratch or a lot of other things, Legos products, Brian did all the sort of made it work. Um, and um, being at this reception where they were having this really lively argument about Ada Lovelace and, and my antenna going up and thinking, wow, I want to be around smart people like this. Um, and, 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 you know, when I got interested in educational computing, it was where the most progressive, wisest, radical educators were. And it's not an accident. You know, the, the work that I continue to do today is rooted in the work that those men and women were engaged in. And they came out of the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement and the women's right. movement. Um, you know, Social Papert, yeah. Pap, you know, Papert worked with, you know, Pepper worked w- with Mandela before Mandela went to prison. He was a dissident who had to sneak out of his, his home country of South Africa um, and traveled for a number of years without a passport because of his a- activism in the 40s and 50s. Um, and so, and they also were, were deeply rooted in progressive education traditions. And I know that in all the work that I did with Pepper, you, you couldn't mention anyone who mattered in progressive education, who he, had, he didn't know or, and wasn't familiar with their work, which again, it was... It, it wasn't just adding a computer to an otherwise unchanged educational environment. It was computing as an intellectual laboratory and vehicle for self-expression, mm. you know, a, a way of amplifying the potential of every, of every learner, a way of democratizing a greater breadth and depth and range of projects that were, than were ever possible before. Um, one of my favorite quotes from Seymour Papert is that everyone needs a prosthetic. And and that's a good way of thinking about all the sort of hype about AI these days as well. You're right. Um, right. So, um, yeah, so I've been at this for a really long time and then created one of the first online master's degree programs that were kind of rooted in these ideas for Pepperdine University. And 
and have taught everything from preschool through the doctoral level. Uh, you know, so I'm, I'm going to Australia in August and I said, you know, I'm doing this and that. I'm going to be working out of school with first and second graders for, for a while. And, and, you know, someone said to me, and what are you going to do? And I, and I kind of jokingly said, oh, the exact same thing I did with kids last week, with adults last week in Philadelphia. And the thing that I'll do at another school with high schoolers and um, that there's, there's a consistency. And, uh, and a lot of what I'm doing today um, is, is rooted in a quest for preserving the timeless and re- and recognizing that there's a difference between timeless and old. Ah, uh, Okay. Yeah. And and I think the tech community would benefit from being able to differentiate between timeless and old. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that because you also said earlier I picked you up picked up on something you said that you're working in a time when leaders were radical radically were radical about things that they were doing and the technology they're doing. That implies that currently that's not the current situation. What what's your overlay? What's uh, give your ten thousand foot view of the landscape of ed tech currently as you see it? seen all the path that you've traveled and how all that social stuff that's kind of come out, that's not, maybe not there as much anymore. Cause they may, maybe now it's more driven by consumerism, but what, I, what, what's, I, well, your, what's your feel? Yeah. I think there's a lot of consumption and I think there's a lot of status that's attached to buying the latest thing or, you know, change. I mean, it, it's, it's extraordinary to me when you look at, you know, things, you know, generative AI, specifically chat GPT, how it, it, completely revolutionized education over Christmas vacation. Right. Um, and, and the number of LinkedIn bios that have been changed to expert, AI expert. in AI yeah. and education. Prompt it's engineer. Just, uh, yeah. Yeah. The, the, the level of chutzpah is just <laughs> staggering. Um, yeah. It's just extraordinary to me. And, you know, sometimes AI is just software. Um, the, uh, so I'm trying to figure out a way that, that gives kids maximum agency over this. Um, and that hopefully will then help the adults behave better and more rationally. And, um, you know, someone came up to me from a state department of education a couple of nights ago and, and said, we're being asked to create policies on, on AI. Are we qualified to do that? And I said, no. <laughs> it's flat out. Yeah. But who is, um, I mean, I, there's a very small well, amount of people that actually, yeah. Maybe we should just chillax. To yeah, quote the there, great we Pee-wee Herman. there we go. Wow, we've gone from uh, the gods must be crazy to Pee Wee Herman on this podcast already. <laughs> yeah, um, we, maybe we should just maybe we should just chillax. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, just chillax. Well, you know that's what that's what Musk and and Zuckerberg and everyone's saying is like, oh, we should all slow down. Of course, it makes me wonder, like, why are they telling all of us to slow down? Uh, is it because they're trying to catch up? I, who knows? You know, there's well, the, the more you that. use it, the, the more you use it, the, the 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 more you realize how bad it is. Um, yeah. The results, yes, and, yeah, and you know, the, and, and change it rapidly, and it'll get better, and all of that. And it's like, okay, cool, and then fine, I'll be ready for it. But because I've actually have some some background knowledge and some experience, some expertise, I mean, you know, you know as well as I do, we still encounter teachers in workshops who can't use their trackpad, and and finding your file is kind of, you know, the doctoral level of educational technology. Um, yeah. knowing where you saved your file. So copy and paste is like postdoc work. Um, so I just don't have a lot of confidence in having sort of folk create policy that's going to bind us to something that's moving so rapidly. Um, what, what, I mean, I was thinking about what you just said too about over the over Christmas break, how this all changed. Isn't it kind of strange? That but it pandemic- didn't. I know, but like a pandemic that was supposed to change all of us. Remember the pandemic came and like, we're all going to change. We're going to have to learn and teach differently. And then everything kind of went away and then it all kind of went back. And now there's now, now AI, that's the thing. That's the thing that's going to drive the change. But you just said it didn't. So, well, the, op- <laughs> the optimistic, the optimistic view of that is that and Papert used to always find the silver lining and things like this, that, that it, that it reflects a yearning for something different. Okay. Right. So then it's my job to, to help people see that we stand on the shoulders of giants, that every problem in education has been solved somewhere before. I heard Bill Clinton say that once, that, you know, if you say to me, I have no idea what to do, swing by my house. I've got a couple thousand books. I've got a large collection of progressive education literature from the 60s. I've curated stuff online with, you know, videos of teachers in South Carolina in 1972 talking about open education and, you know, the British infant school movement. I, I'll take you to Reggio Emilia with me. Um, you know, we know what to do. Um, so, so I can fill in the blanks. So it shows on the optimistic side 
a desire for, for an alternative. Um, on the other hand, it's preposterous that it changed education. And then the, the last thing I'll say about that is, if you want to use the pandemic as a metaphor, I think there were, there were two stages of the pandemic. I think there was the, the spring of 2020 where people were dying and everyone was scared and school leaders and policymakers said, hey, you know what? Let's not die. Take care of one another. Be, be kind to one another. Let's let the standardized testing go. Let's make yeah. sure we can we, we know where, where everyone is. And let's see if we can keep kids and teachers motivated and happy and safe. And I remember during that time saying to anyone who would listen, don't go to any meetings this summer. And just rest, take care of yourself. And my instincts um, were right. And what followed those meetings was worse than I could have ever imagined. We got Bitmoji classrooms and uniform policies for kids in their bedroom and new new learning disabilities that were invented and 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 the worst forms of instructionism of pouring information into kids' heads. And I would I will tell you, I, I would go to my grave arguing this. The Moms for Liberty conference that's happening in Philadelphia now yes. and 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 this this backlash and this unbelievable tsunami of anti-public education in particular rhetoric um, is rooted in the open kimono movement of parents getting a gutful of what school looked like and they were unimpressed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My, my, my wife felt and, the same way as, as a lay person who's not in education. She came around, she came around the corner once to see my daughter's teacher telling every single kid out of the 42 kids she had in a remote class of second grade to talk about what they did that summer. And I was like, by the time it got to my daughter, it was two and a half hours later. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and kid. how about, how about, you, how you. about inventing, how about inventing complete like hybrid instruction? Okay. Yeah, I understand. That was, that was Some a mess. That was a mess. But yes. now it's a thing. Now it's a thing. Now you can be certified in it. Yeah. Right. It wasn't just, it wasn't just a bad idea. Now it's a thing. Now, now people will get, now people will write papers about it and sell products based on it. If, if you had, Half the kids who were coming to school and half the kids who were remote, a rational system would have taken a deep breath and said, you know what, Carl, yeah. you teach the kids who are online and you, Gary, you teach the kids who are face to face. No, but instead we propped an iPad up at the back of the room. And then taught them both at the same time, equally bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know. I said the same thing. I was like, this is the worst knee jerk we've ever done. But, and then eventually, it wasn't our e district, yeah. It wasn't it equally bad. It, it was, mo yeah, it wasn't ahead. equally bad. It was multiplicatively bad. It was exponentially yes. bad. Yes. So, right. Let's pivot, let's pivot real quick. I don't want to get too far size. down that road. Yeah. <laughs> Tell size. me about places that are doing it right. Play you travel all over the world. Oh. So, I'd love to hear, like, like what? No, I'm not, I'm not saying like perfect either because no one's doing this perfect. Yeah. yeah. But, but where, where do you see, like, what are the, kind of the foundational skills at the schools that are actually integrating all of this well and, and that constructivist approach and like, where is it actually happening? Well, that you've seen it. You know, I, I, the one thing I've observed over time is that bad ideas are timeless and impervious to geographic boundaries and good ideas tend to be incredibly fragile. You know, yes. this month marks my, my 33rd anniversary of working in, in laptop schools, the first schools in the world where every kid had a laptop. I was lucky enough to, lead professional development in some Australian schools that embraced that idea. And we taught entire faculties of K-12 teachers to teach programming across the curriculum that we wanted to democratize these experiences. And then some kids could choose computer science formally as their project if they wanted, but that um, we were adding colors to the crayon box. Um, and then, you know, all the principal changes and those things go away. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we wrote Invent to Learn, which has been called the Bible, the maker movement in schools. That just celebrated its 10th anniversary. It's been published Yay. in nine languages. Amazing. Book. And, yes. Great and book. there was thanks. And, there, you know, and we were building upon Nicholas Negroponte and Neil Gershenfeld's ideas about we can now make things with bits and atoms. And unfortunately, the part of the part that's left in schools after 10 years of the maker movement is a lot of atoms. There's a lot of cardboard being cut up. And but Legos. the bits yeah. aren't. Yeah. But the bits aren't. And you know, um, I always say, you know, computers are a way of making things, and computers are a way of making things go. And computing is the secret sauce. And and I think there's a lot of really exciting work being done, um, with, you know, because of the micro bit, the accessibility, the the power of it, the, the the fact that you know, in 15 minutes, I can get a teacher involved in engineering and robotics projects and and real computing. Um, 
and and Stephen Wolfram's work with Wolfram language and mm-hmm. and massively computational systems that that now can do really exciting things with large language models as well. Um, and yet, I don't hear any discussions of any of that. And, and so, I'm trying to figure out a way to make that, that work accessible to teachers and get a new generation of people excited about it. Um, you know, I've been at this long enough that now teachers say, "Oh, I remember that. That that let's do that again." <laughs> which bring is, that back. Which is bring it back. Which yeah. is you know, which which is fantastic. I think there's a hunger for that. So, um, you know, I think we need to be able to answer the question that. Seymour Papert began asking in the late 1960s, which was, does the computer program the child or the child program the computer? And at a time of threats to democracy and rising rising authoritarianism and science skepticism, um, the reason why every kid should learn the program is it's it's a liberal art that gives you agency over an increasingly complex and technologically sophisticated world. And it, it provides some perspective so that when then the new piece of software comes along, you, you neither think it's going to revolutionize everything or kill us all. Um, right. And, and so, you know, that, that's, and, and even that, you know, my, my, one of my heroes, Jimmy Heath, a great saxophone, jazz saxophonist used to say, what was good is good. And, you know, for the people who are concerned about the ethical issues around AI, even, um, I just I remembered I've read the book a thousand times, but in Seymour Papert's 1980 book Mindstorms, there's a chap chapter seven is called Logo Roots AI and Piaget, <laughs> and he offers a humane a humane learner centered vision of artificial intelligence as a as a human amplif- amplif- amplification system amplifier um, that had AI research followed that route we wouldn't have the kind of ethical questions we now have. And um, maybe, maybe we can have a little bit of a course correction. If we sort of recognize that it's not good or bad, it it could be, I'm not arrogant enough to say we can shape it, but I think we can find some way of adapting and, and taking the best parts and, and using it in a constructive way and forming policy that doesn't further alienate kids that doesn't either use the technology to punish or surveil them. Um, but but creates opportunities from the not just learn what we've always wanted to teach them with greater efficiency or comprehension or but the efficacy but to learn and do in ways that were unimaginable just a couple of years ago you know what's what what's the part that we can do that we couldn't do before how do we seize that right i we could, this could come, i could have a conversation with you for hours my my friend um unfortunately i'm over time but uh, so i'm going to ask this before we wrap out i want to know more about where can people find more about you and the great work you're doing uh, where should they go? ProfessorGaryStager.com is kind of the personal website. Um, Constructing Modern Knowledge is the um, institute that I'm running July 10th through 14th in Manchester, New Hampshire. It's in its 14th year. Mountain of Materials, an amazing faculty. Teachers reacquainting themselves with learning and um, spending four days uninterrupted working on personally meaningful projects and asserting, reasserting the confidence and competence and creativity of educators. Um, and after Invent to Learn was published, we started having educators come to us with similar visions of education and saying, "We you know, could you help us? And so we formed Constructing Modern Knowledge Press, which is cmkpress.com. We've published about 15 books there, including the most recent um, two books, 20 Things to Do with the Computer, Forward 50, which is a collection of essays by people I respect and love. And um, and Invent to Learn, Guide to the Microbit, which is a Oh, nice. computer science tech, a computer science text that you know one of the things i discovered is when you look at technical books written for educators they tend to go from hello world to in two pages <laughs> and, and 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 there's a real art of yes. teaching there's a real art of teaching that requires you that that requires the ability to design an open ended project for the fifth activity in learning how to do something Right. You know, what's the fifth project? Pick a domain and how would we design an activity for someone who's on en route um, that we don't even either just have beginners or experts and we lose everyone in the middle. Um, and it was written by two Dutch educators who had incredibly creative ideas. And we spent a lot of time shaping it to have a coherent vision. You can use it as as a reference guide or I think you could probably use it as a complete curriculum. Um, so so that's cmkpress.com. Awesome. He is uh, Gary Sager, everybody, a gem in the ed tech world. Uh, thank you so much. I, I cherish you spending the time with us on the podcast, Gary, and sharing your knowledge with us. 
Um, thank you for everyone else for being a part of the Let's Talk Computer Science Podcast again and our friends at Rex Academy for making this possible. Be sure to check out their platform at rex.academy. We all know that technology will be a part of our future and as educators and leaders, it's our role to make sure that all students, that means all students have an opportunity to that future as well. This is Carl Hooker signing off. <laughs>